Hi everyone, sorry, just give me one second to set everything up. Hmm. Wait, Chris, it's sending the verification to, I'm guessing, Tim's number? Probably for the YouTube Live. Yeah. Yeah, you can see if he answers, but you may just have to go ahead and then upload it later. Let me, let me text them. Hi everyone, uh, my name is David. I'm gonna be doing the um, lecture on cardiovascular system today. Sorry, just give me one second. Um, and Chris is here today too, if you guys need any help. Okay, um, so yeah, like I said, my name is David. I'm gonna be doing the cardiovascular system today. Um, sorry, if you guys need me to repeat anything, um, just let me know, because I uh, recently lost my tooth playing basketball. So just let me know if I mumble or speak with a list, just let me know if I need to repeat anything. Okay. Okay. So just a quick description on the course. Um, so it's a 15 week MCAT course. I believe we're on week five right now. Um, so we have lectures every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday on Zoom at 8.30 PM. And then every Sunday, we also have office hours on Zoom if you wanna ask like more specific questions or go over problems. And here's just a page for the links for the group me if you haven't joined the group me chat. Um, we also have a YouTube channel where we post uh, the, the videos of the lectures, and then we also cut it down to smaller um, videos if you need more specific help on a topic. We also have a website, SocraticMed.net, and then our Instagram too, if you want to follow it, SocraticMed. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, you're doing extraordinarily well. Like, I commend you right now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so just some quick learning objectives for the uh, lesson today. We're just, we're going to go over the parts of the cardiovascular system, and we're going to go over how it functions as a whole, and then what each part of the cardiovascular system does. And then we're also going to follow the circulation of the blood throughout the body and the heart as well. So just the cardiovascular system as a whole, it includes the heart and the vascular vasculature, which is like all the blood vessels in your body and then the blood in the blood vessels as well. Um, so what does the cardiovascular system do? It mainly transports gas, nutrients and waste throughout your body. It um, acts as like a transport system for everything in your body from, um, from the heart to the the muscle and the tissue throughout your body and then back to the heart again. The cardiovascular system also helps to maintain your body temperature. It um, helps with thermoregulation. And then also it acts as an immune defense against like bacteria, viruses, anything that wants to invade your body. And then finally, it also acts um, as a blood clot uh, system where um, if you get injured, if any, um, if your blood so uh, is injured or um, damaged, it'll act to
to coagulate the blood and help repair whatever was injured. Okay. So firstly, we'll go over the heart. Um, heart is obviously a very important part of your body. It acts as a pump. So there's actually two different pumps um, that the heart acts as. Um, the left side acts as one pump and then the right side acts as a different pump. So there's actually two different pumps that work in um, unison in the heart. So the, the heart, it helps circulate the blood throughout the vasculature um, and it's made of strong cardiac muscle. Um, the cardiac muscle has intercalated discs uh, with many gap junctions to help the muscle cells communicate. So the gap junctions, they'll um, send action potentials and anything to um, regulate the action potentials throughout all the cardiac muscles. So then you get a uniform um, heartbeat. Yeah, and like I said before, the right and the left side have different pumps. So one side acts as the pulmonary circulation and then the other side acts for the systemic circulation. And so the heart, it has four different chambers, a ventricle and an atria on each side. Um, so I'll get into that more on the next slide. Um, so we'll get into that in the parts of the heart. So the heart has four different chambers. There's the atria, two atrias, and then two ventricles. So the atria are at the top. Um, there's one on each side and they're thin walled. So they're not as muscular as the ventricles. They're thinner and all, they have a lot less muscle. So what they do is they receive the blood from either the vena cava on the right side or the pulmonary veins on the left side. And they, when they are filled with blood, they'll set, contract and send the blood into the ventricles for the ventricles to send the blood to either the rest of their body or to the lungs. Um, so what I uh, think is important is if you look at this picture, you see how, oops, sorry, um, you see how the right side um, of the picture, it, it actually says left atrium and left ventricle. And then the left side of the picture, it says right atrium and right ventricle. So that's always the way that it'll be labeled. So you have to know, remember that the left side of the picture is actually the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart is actually on the right side of the screen. So always imagine that you're staring at someone else's heart. So even though the it may look like the left atrium and left ventricle are on the right side of the picture, it's actually the left side. So whenever you see a picture of a heart, just remember on the right side is actually the left ventricle and left atrium if you while looking at the picture. And then if you look at the picture, the left side is actually the right atrium and the right ventricle. Um, and then the ventricles. So once the ventricles um, are filled by the atria, they'll contract to send the blood to the lungs for the pulmonary circulation or systemic circulation, which is the rest of your body. And like I said, they're more muscular than atria, which makes sense because they have to send the blood much farther than the atria. So the atria just had to send it to the ventricle, but then the ventricles had to send it all the way to um, like your toes and your brain. So it's much farther than the atria. That's why they have a lot uh, more muscle. And so uh, what separates the atria and the ventricle are valves. So the atrioventricular valve, the AV valves, um, they separate the atria and the ventricles, which makes sense since atrioventricular is in the atria and ventricles are in the name. And on the right side, um, right atria and ventricle, it's separated by the tricuspid valve and it's called the tricuspid valve because there's actually three leaflets while the bicuspid or another name for it is the vitral valve. It's and it has two leaflets and it separates the left, left atria and left ventricle. And a good mnemonic to memorize that is lab rat. So left atria bicuspid and then right atria tricuspid. 
Um, I've also heard the, the saying, um, it's try before you buy. So try cuspid comes before buy cuspid, which makes sense since the, the blood travels through the, the right side of your heart before it goes to the left side. And then the semilunar valves, they separate the ventricles from the vasculature. So the pulmonary, on the pulmonary side, it separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary circulation. And then the aortic valve, it separates the left ventricle from the aorta. Um, any questions so far? Sorry, I was going kind of fast. Um, not sure. uh, Chris, is there flow to the ventricles? Like you gave the mnemonic lab rat. I learned it like toilet paper my ass. Like, Sorry, I can't. Um, uh, Opal, you're, you have some um, like static. I, can't. I thought I did. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Is there a flow to the blood flow with the, the ventricles? Because I learned the mnemonic like tissue paper my ass. It goes from tricuspid to pulmonary to aortic, and then to mitral and then to aortic. So is there a blood flow order through the ventricles? I mean, through the valves? Or are you going to go through that later? Um, yeah, so I'll, I'm going to go through it right now, um, okay. the circulation. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So this is just, um, I thought this was a really good picture for the circulation. Um, so you see on the, um, let's see, the left side of the picture, that's the pulmonary, the pulmonary circulation and um, I like how it's blue to show that it's deoxygenate, deoxygenated blood. So when it, the blood is coming back from the body tissues, it's deoxygenated. And then when the blood pumps, the, uh, the heart pumps the blood to the lungs, it gets oxygenated. And then that's why the right side is red to show that it's oxygenated blood. And then the, the, the heart will send the blood back to the body tissues to distribute the oxygen and other gases. So I'll go more in depth into that. So I just typed out this um, this like map for the circulation of the blood. Um, you're gonna have to memorize this, um, but let me, yeah. So I started off this um, map at the superior and inferior vena cava. So those are the vessels sending the blood back to the heart on the right side. So deoxygenated blood comes back from the rest of your body and enters the right atria via the superior and inferior vena cava. And so the superior vena cava brings all the blood from the um, blood from your body above the heart. And then the inferior vena cava transports all the bloods from below your heart to to the right atrium. So, um, so the right atrium, it'll pass through the fill up. And then once it's filled up, it'll pass through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricles. And then the right ventricle will push the blood through the pulmonary valve and send it to the lungs via the pulmonary arteries. So at the lungs, the blood from um, the heart, it'll exchange gas and waste with the capillaries lining the alve the capillaries lining, the capillaries will exchange gas and waste with the alveoli. So um, the CO2 that you, uh, the blood picked up from the rest of your body will exit out your body through the lungs. And then the oxygen that uh, you breathe in will go from lungs into the blood. So there's like a concentration gradient where the blood is pretty high in um, carbon dioxide when it uh, travels from the heart to the lungs. And then the lungs will have a higher concentration of oxygen than the blood. 
So it'll exchange the carbon dioxide and the oxygen. And then once the blood is oxygenated at the lungs, it'll exit the lungs via the pulmonary venules, and then those will condense into pulmonary veins, and then it'll enter the left atrium. And then once it's filled, it'll go from the left atrium to the left ventricle through the mitral valve, and then from the left ventricle to the, to the aorta via the aortic valve. And then the aorta will divide into smaller arteries and then even smaller arterioles. And once it reaches capillaries, the, um, the gas and the nutrients will be exchanged from the blood to the interstitium, interstitium at, the, at, your, at the rest of your body. So this is where the oxygen leaves your blood and the carbon dioxide that the tissue and the muscle um, created will enter the blood as bicarbonate. And then the cycle starts all over again. So the capillaries will combine into venules and then into veins that are larger. And finally, they'll all empty into the right side of the heart via the superior and vena inferior vena cava. Sorry, so that was a lot. Um, so this is just the circulation of the blood. It just keeps repeating over and over again um, via each heartbeat. Um, any questions on that? Sorry, that was like a lot. <laughs> How did you remember this? <laughs> did you have like a jingle? Did you, were you just like flashcards? Did you just look at like the diagram of the heart and kind of just kept going over and over? Like um, for me, I um, it's I think it's good to draw a diagram. So like I would okay. look at this diagram. So like I've studied this diagram and other ones so much that like it's just like embedded in my head now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but I always like to start it. Um, so I would start it like this and uh, start it where I started here from deoxygenated blood entering the right side of the heart through the inferior vena, inferior and in superior vena cava. I think okay. that's how most textbooks start it. And I think that's like the most helpful. So like you separate um, the two different sides of the heart into the pulmonary and systemic circulation. Um, yeah, so I, I would um, try like practice drawing the diagrams out, um, tracing the path that the blood goes through and just keep doing that. And then there are like mm -hmm. small tips and tricks, but I don't think there's one that like covers the whole circulation. Whole yeah. yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that was a good question. Hopefully I helped. Yes, it, it did. And then, the, um, well, Oprah has kind of the same question I was just getting ready to ask. Um, you said pulmonary, pulmonary, and then systemic. Systemic is the one that kind of goes through the body first, and then pulmonary is the one that goes through the lungs, right? Yeah, so pulmonary, yeah, so I'm going to go actually go over the next, but um, yeah, the go pulmonary, ahead. it goes to the lungs, which is um, easy to remember, pulmonary lungs. And then systemic, um, you can kind of remember as like, it goes to the rest of the system. So everywhere yeah, systems, except the lungs. Yeah. Yep, yep, yeah. yeah. So I believe that's the next slide. Yep, so um, so the two halves of the heart, they're separated into two different circulations. So they're both, um, each side acts as a pump, but both pumps pump, uh, send the blood to different parts of the body. So the pulmonary uh, circulation, which is the right side of the heart, it takes the deoxygenated blood returning from the rest of the body and it moves it through the right atria and the right ventricle to the lungs via the pulmonary arteries. Um, so the pulmonary circulation, it takes deoxygenated blood and sends it to the lungs to be oxygenated. And then the systemic uh, circulation, which is the left side of the heart, it'll take the oxygenated blood's uh, the oxygenated blood from the lungs and send it through the pulmonary veins to the rest of your body to distribute all the oxygen and other um, gases. So it sends it uh, from the, the left atria and the vent left ventricle through the aorta 
Oh, wait. Yeah, so, sorry. Um, I don't know if I said this wrong, but so the left, the left side of the heart system, the systemic circulation, it receives the blood from the lungs via the pulmonary veins and sends it out through the aorta. Um, any questions on that? And then this diagram is pretty good too. It also labels it um, red as the oxygen rich blood and the blue as the oxygen poor blood. So I would try to study these as like two different circulations. And then once you're comfortable with each one separately, I would, you can combine them together to get the whole circulation of the body. Um, so any questions on that? Okay, I'll move on to, okay. So we're gonna have a question. Um, so the tricuspid valve that I talked about, um, which, which um, so pretty much it's asking the tricuspid valve prevents backflow of blood from the, so if the tricuspid valve was not functioning, where would um, blood end up where it's not supposed to be? And I'm gonna give you a few minutes on this question. So try to remember um, the mnemonic lab rat. That should be a clue. I'll give you about 30 more seconds. and the polling. So most people thought the answer was D. And that's right. So yeah, the um, so the tricuspid valve is between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So if the tricuspid valve wasn't working, it would allow the blood that was in the right ventricle to go back into the right atria, which is not good. So everyone, uh, Everyone did a good job. Uh, most people got it right. Yeah, and the the not uh, the mnemonic lab rat. So R A T right atria uh, tricuspid. So I think everyone um, should learn that mnemonic. Um, any questions on this uh, question? All right, I'm gonna go on to the next slide. So I'm gonna go over the electric conduction of the heart. So how the, the heart um, uses electric signals to um, pump the blood and how a heartbeat works. So the electrical conduction of the heart. Um, so 
the heart is um, the heart pumps the blood via coordinated rhythmic contractions of cardiac muscle by electrical impulses. So the heart, it receives a signal from the SA node, the sinoatrial node. So the heartbeat actually, the, uh, the electrical signal for a heartbeat actually starts at the SA node, which is um, near the right atrium. Thing. So um, your heart normally, it'll beat without, obviously it'll beat without having you to send a signal um, there because the SA node, it creates a electrical signal every 60, uh, it'll create in a minute about 60 to 100 signals to, for your heart to beat, which makes sense since most people's um, heart rate is about between 60 to 100, unless um, you're um, an athlete, then you'll have a pretty low heart rate or, um, there are other things like stress, um, uh, exercise that will increase your heart rate, like and any certain um, certain hormones and particles like norepinephrine or um, epinephrine, uh, epinephrine that will increase your heart rate when you're like fighting or under stress or in fear that will increase your heart rate, but. Uh, Every signal for a heartbeat starts at the SA node. And then that signal will be propagated to the AV node, which is in between the atrium and ventricle, which makes sense since it's called the atrioventricular node. So it starts at the SA node and then goes to the AV node, which is between the atrium and ventricle in the middle on each side. And then um, the signal stops there for a few moments while the atria uh, fills up. And then once it fills up, it'll send the blood to the ventricles. And this is when the bundle of his, or otherwise known as the AV bundle, will branch off onto um, the ventricles on each side. So it'll split off into the right and the left ventricles. And then it'll break off further into the uh, Purkinje fibers that will distribute the signal to the rest of the, uh, the rest of the muscle and the ventricle. So, um, so the electric conduction of the heart, it happens on both sides of the heart simultaneously. So each ventricle will pump out blood at the same time. And this has to be like a, Coordinator spot, uh, coordinated contraction or else your heart will not uh, pump regularly. Uh, any questions on this part? So this part you'll need to know the, 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 the way it propagates from the SA node to the AV node, then the bundle of his and then the Purkinje fibers. Um, everyone understand this part? Okay. Um, we're gonna have another question. Um, this should be an easy one. So what was the correct sequence of a cardiac impulse? I'm gonna relaunch the poll. Let's see if everyone is paying attention. Um, yeah, I just saw in the chat about like the measurements of the heart or the the speed, um, you don't really need to know that. I think this, this diagram I found um, had that, but no, you don't need to know the, the specific like speeds of the impulse or the size. Um, and yes, Kazi, the bundle of his and the AV bundle are the same thing. Okay, I'll 
tell you guys um, about 30 more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling now. And everyone, um, mostly everyone picked D and that's the correct answer. Yeah, so it goes from the SA node to the AV node to the bundle hiss and then finally the Purkinje fibers. All right, any questions on that? All right, I'll move on to the next one. So then I'm gonna go over a general heartbeat. So a heartbeat consists of two different parts, systole and diastole. So systole is when the ventricles are contracting and sending out the blood from the heart to either the lungs or the systemic circulation to the rest of the body. And for this to happen, you need the AV valve, so the valves between the atria and the ventricle to be closed so that it prevents any backflow of the blood and it creates the pressure needed for the ventricles to drive the blood from the heart to the rest of the body. So the AV valves have to be closed in order for the, the ventricles to generate enough pressure to send the blood all the way from the heart to your toes. And then diastole is the opposite. It's when the heart is relaxed, the semi-lunar valves are closed. So blood isn't being sent to the lungs or the systemic circulation. And the blood from the atria is passively filling up the ventricles. So the heart is receiving the blood from the vena cava and the pulmonary veins and filling up the, the atria on both sides before it fills up the ventricles. And then um, some of you may know when you listen to a heartbeat, you'll hear like a lub dub sound. So the lub is actually the mitral valve. So the bicuspid valve and the tricuspid valves closing after the ventricles are filled with blood. So the two valves between the atria and the ventricles on either side, they'll close. And that's what you're hearing with the lub sound. So that's the, the heart closing the valve so then the ventricles can fill up with so after the ventricles are filled up with blood so it can send it out the send the blood out of the heart and then on the other side um, the dub is when the aortic valves and the pulmonary valves on each side so the pulmonary valves on the the right side and then the aortic valves on the left side are closed and the that, that is after the ventricles have pumped out the blood from the heart. So this is when um, the blood is has left the heart and it's gonna start filling up the heart again. So systole is when the heart is contracted and diastole is when the heart is relaxed. Um, any questions on this part? So, so the lub, sorry, this is Taja again. So the lub is systole and the dub is diastole. Just based, based off of what I'm reading or no, it's the other way around. Uh, well, yeah, so the lub is right before, I guess, yeah, the lub is right before systole. So the lub you're hearing are the valves closing and then systole happens where the, um, the ventricles contract. So the lub is right before the systole and then the dub is um, right before the diastole. Okay, thank you. Good question. I have a question. What's your, uh, sure, what's your question, Opal? We... Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. 
sorry. David, can you hear me now? When we take the blood pressure and we get mm -hmm. the 120 over 80, what are we measuring? Yeah, so the 120, the top number is the systole. And that's when the heart is contracted and the pressure is the great is the greatest. And then diastole is the the lower number, so the 80, and that's when the heart is relaxed. You're at your it's at the lowest blood pressure. So usually you want systole to be under 140 and then diastole to be um, under 100. So when it's either too high or too low, that's when you have a problem. So you want to be between, um, you want to be as close to pretty much 120 over 80 as you can. Did that question answer your question, Opal? Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, that was a good question too. Um, any other questions? I have one more. Sure. What about a heart block? Where, like, when you do the pacemaker, or where, where are they putting it? Is any of this stuff affected, like the beating? Uh, if yes. You do the pacemaker, are you still getting the lub dub, or is um, it? Yeah. So the pacemaker is is um, not actually like the anything uh, any problems with the valves. So a pacemaker um, actually sets the rhythm of your heart. So you remember when I said um, the the SA note, it automatically uh, sends out about 60 to 100 um, electrical signals per minute. So that's how many times your heart beats. So a pacemaker is someone with um, uh, like an irregular rhythm or arrhythmia where their heartbeat is not normal. It'll, you want to have like a lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. But um, anyone with uh, a irregular rhythm, they won't have a uh, like a consistent heartbeat. So you need a pacemaker to correct the, the irregular heartbeat. Um, yeah, so that that would not be on the test. It's more like a, like a medical question, something you'll learn in like medical school. Okay, good. Yeah. They might like mention a pacemaker on the, on the MCAT, but it would be more in the context of like a different question, I believe. Um, any other questions? Okay, all right, I'll move on to the next slide. So this is kind of like the only, um, one of the few like math questions or like equations in um, biology that you'll see. So it's cardiac output. So this measures the total blood volume pumped by the ventricle in a minute. And this can be increased by sympathetic or decreased by parasympathetic nervous system. So like I said before, um, it can be increased and decreased by some, um, like it can be increased by like epinephrine or decreased by, um, by the parasympathetic nervous system when um, you're at rest. Um, so the equation for calculating cardiac output is um, CO, cardiac output, is equal to HR times SV. So HR is the heart rate, and then SV is the stroke volume, which is the blood pumped by uh, the ventricle every beat, which makes sense since, um, so the heart rate is how many times your heart beats in a minute, and then the stroke volume is how much blood is pumped per beat. So that would, when you multiply them, they would equal the cardiac output. And um, this is like a easy question for points on the test. Uh, you just have to memorize this simple equation, cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. All right, any questions on this? So I actually have a question on the cardiac output. 
So a patient's chart reveals that he has a cardiac output of 700 milliliters per minute and a stroke volume of 50 milliliters. What is his pulse in beats per minute? All right, I'm gonna start a poll and give you a few minutes to calculate this. Maybe about 30 more seconds, if anyone wants to get their answer in. I'm going to end the poll now. And looks like almost everyone put oh, almost everyone put B and that's the correct answer. Yeah, so cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. So if you plug in the values for the cardiac output and the stroke volume, um, you just have to divide the cardiac output by the stroke volume, so 700. 7,500 milliliters per minute divided by 50 milliliters, and you get the heart rate is 150 beats per minute, which is pretty high. Um, any questions on this? Yeah, this is a pretty easy equation to remember, easy points on the test if you get this question. All right. I'm going to move on to the next slide. So I'm going to go over the rest of the uh, the rest of the cardiac uh, cardiovascular system. So the vasculature, which is all the blood vessels in your body. So you actually have a lot of different kinds of blood vessels in your body. So we'll start off with the arteries. These carry blood away from your body to the lungs, uh, away from the heart to the lungs and the body. So you can remember A for arteries, A for away. So the arteries carry blood away from your heart to the lungs in your body. It's very muscular and elastic and they branch off into arterioles, which are smaller, but um, still pretty, uh, pretty elastic and muscular. And then the arterioles uh, divide into capillaries so capillaries, they're actually really thin. They only have a single cell layer, but um, that's not 
purpose because these thin one layer uh, one layer cells are used to allow for easy diffusion of the gases and nutrients and waste into the interstitium. So the capillaries will um, send the gases and nutrients into the interstitium. So the rest of the tissues around the, the blood vessels and then the tissues will send the waste back into the blood. So all like the carbon dioxide, any waste like ammonia um, into the, the blood. And then the capillaries will empty into venules, which are smaller veins. And then they combine into the larger um, vessels, which are the veins. And the veins are thin walled inelastic vessels that transport the blood back to the heart. So arteries and arterioles will send the blood away from the heart while the veins and venules send the blood back to the heart. And in order for the veins to send the blood back to the heart, it has to go against gravity, right? So all the veins in your foot, your legs, it has to go against gravity to send the blood back to your heart. And that's accomplished by skeletal muscles. So when you move around, the muscles will contract and they will push the blood from the veins up towards your body. So that's why they recommend like moving around and not sitting still for long periods of time. That's because the, bl uh, the blood will, um, they will collect in your veins if it's unable to send it back to the heart. Okay, any questions on any of the blood vessels? All right, I'll move on to the next slide. And so starling forces. So um, how does the blood know when to uh, send stuff out of the blood and then bring stuff back into the blood? Um, so that's controlled by the starling forces. They help maintain the fluid volume in the heart and then also the concentration of certain solutes in the blood. And this is accomplished by two different opposing forces. So the first one is the hydrostatic pressure. That's the pressure that pushes fluid out of the blood in, into the interstitium. So this is a pressure um, that pushes blood out of the blood vessels and into the rest of your body. And that is... Um, and that is controlled by the other pressure, which is the osmotic or also called the oncotic pressure. So that's the pressure that forces the blood, uh, forces the fluid and the water back into the blood. And that's um, draw, the blood is, um, the blood has solutes um, that draw the water back into the blood. So this is controlled by um, concentration gradients. So when the, the osmotic, uh, the osmolarity is too high, the osmotic pressure will draw fluid back into the blood to maintain a um, more stable uh, osmolarity. So um, in, in the diagram below, you can see that on the arterial side, the hydrostatic pressure, the one on top is greater, which makes sense since the, the blood wants to send um, all the all the fluid back into the interstitium in order to um, in order to exchange the gases and nutrients with the interstitium, so the rest of the body. And then, as you travel from the arterial end to the venial end, the hydrostatic pressure decreases while the osmotic pressure increases. So once it reaches the, the venial end the blood will want to draw back um, some of the fluid because uh, the osmolarity is too high after it sends the blood, uh, sends the fluid from the blood into the tissue. So the osmolarity is too high. So it'll try to draw some fluid back into the blood in order to maintain the osmolarity. Um, yeah, so these two different pressures, they work in conjunction with each other to maintain a um, 
a stable solute concentration and fluid volume in the blood. Any questions on this part? David, do we do we, we need, need to know for some small, small for this? Uh, sorry, set up? Opal, sorry, Opal, you have kind of echo. Can you repeat that again? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Do I need to know Purcell's law for this setup? You know, where you have that P pressure equals? Uh, no, so uh, you wouldn't need to know like the specific equation for it. Um, you just need to know that on the arterial end, the hydrostatic pressure is greater while the osmotic uh, pressure is greater on the, the venial side in order to um, maintain the the blood uh, volume and concentration. So you wouldn't need to know, um, that's more, that law is more for like physics um, and chemistry. You wouldn't need it for this part. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, all right, so finally, I'm going to go over the blood that the, the blood vessels carry. So the blood is actually made up of a bunch of different stuff. It's just not, not just like red blood cells. So the liquid part, the plasma, it's made of a mixture of nutrients, salts, gases, hormones, and proteins. So everything that the, the tissues may need mix into the 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 fluid in the blood, and that's the plasma. But um, and then the, there are also cells in the uh, in the blood. So the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, those are the cells that transport oxygen using the hemoglobin to bind the oxygen. And the red blood cells use glycolysis for ATP, so it doesn't use up the oxygen that it carries. And then the so for the blood, it also has the leukocytes, so the white blood cells, and that's how the blood helps with the immune system. Um, they, the leukocytes, um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds, but um, as a whole, they defend against infection by virus, parasites, bacteria, anything that would want to harm the body. But also in the blood, there are thrombocytes, which are platelets. So those are the, the, the little molecules that help with blood clots. So when you um, have a break in your skin or any damage to your blood vessels, those are the ones that will uh, help with blood clots. And oh, any questions on that part? Okay, all right, um, I'm gonna go on to another question. So this is about the starling forces. Um, so the question is at the venous end of the capillary bed, the osmotic pressure is, all right, I'm gonna give you a few questions, uh, a few minutes on this one. It can be kind of tricky. All right, I'm gonna relaunch the poll and give everyone a few minutes for this.
Um, I see in the chat, Ruth asked, um, what, how would you describe the interstitium? So pretty much anything like out, uh, surrounding the, the blood vessels. So pretty much all like the, the muscle, the tissue, the parts of the body around the blood vessels that are receiving and uh, receiving anything from the blood and then um, exchanging waste with the blood as well. So when people say like interstitium, just uh, remember it as um, whatever is exchanging um, with the blood, the blood vessels. So anything surrounding the blood vessels. Um, yeah, I see Jessica, um, do you need to know specific white blood cells? Yeah, so you need to know like the different um, the different leukocytes like eosinophils and neutrophils. We'll go more into that in the immune system lecture. I believe that's coming up in a few weeks. So they'll go, <clears throat> sorry, more in detail with that. Um, all right, it looks like almost everyone answered um i'll give maybe like 10 20 more seconds and in case anyone wants to answer okay i'm not in the poll now so most people answered A, and that's great to answer. So at the venous end, um, the osmotic pressure is greater than the hydrostatic pressure because the arterial on that, sorry, um, on the venous end, the osmotic pressure wants to pull in more fluid from the interstitium because after the hydrostatic pressure pushed out uh, most of the fluid in the blood um, to the rest of the tissue, the concentration of like proteins, the oncotic pressure, uh, the oncotic concentration does, uh, the osmotic pressure is higher because the concentration of like proteins, the oncotic concentration is a lot higher. So it'll want to pull back some of the fluid that it pushed out into the tissue in order to correct the, the osmolarity. Um, but yeah, it looks like most people got that. Um, any questions on that part? Um, it looks like, sorry, I think I just saw, um, Kazi asked why C is incorrect. Um, yeah, so C, um, so the osmotic pressure, oh, hmm. Oh, I think I might have missed, made a mistake on that one. Yeah, so the osmotic pressure would be higher than the arterial end. Yeah, yep, sorry about that. I made a mistake. Um, yeah, so the osmotic pressure would be um, higher on the arterial end, actually. Sorry about that. Um, any other questions on that? I'll change this before I post it, but yeah. So the osmotic pressure is higher than the hydrostatic pressure on the venous end, and it's higher on the, than the arterial end as well. Um, um, yeah, so the osmotic pressure is higher on the venous end because it wants to draw in some of the 
the fluid from the interstitium in order to replenish the blood volume, while the um, while the hydrostatic pressure is higher on the arterial end because the blood wants to push the 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 blood volume out to exchange with the the interstitium. Um, Yeah, so the answer is A, but also C. I think I was meant to write low, lower than the osmotic pressure at the arterial end. But yeah, so as of right now, the question um, A and C are both correct, but I'll change. Um, yeah, I'll change this in when I post the actual lecture. Sorry about that. Uh, any other questions on this question? Okay, and yeah, that's the end of this lecture for today. Any um, questions on anything in the anything in the lecture in particular? Anything you want me to go over again? Um, Jessica wants the link to the group meet. Um, I believe it. I have it on the lecture, but it might be easier if I like find it. Hold on one second. Um, let me find the group meet. All right, thanks everyone for tuning in to my first lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, just unmute or put it in the chat. Uh, let me try to get the, the group meet link. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, so yeah, I just posted the group me link. David, if you, I hope all your if you um, going. if you reduce the diameter of, I'm just reading one of the questions of a, of a precapillary vessel. What, uh, how would that affect movement um, from the vessel to the interstitial space? Um, sorry, can you repeat that again? What happened when you decrease the size of a vessel, a precapillary vessel? How does that affect movement at all, or even, or does it affect it at all? Pressure, uh, movement. Yeah. So when you the decrease the, the decrease the um, size of a vessel, um, it would probably decrease the um, decrease the movement just because the the area of the vessel. The amount of blood that can pass through the vessel at a single amount of time would be smaller, so I would decrease the movement. But then that would also increase the pressure because you'll mm -hmm. have the same amount of blood, but you'll have smaller vessels for the blood to travel through, which would increase the pressure. I'm just going to work on some of these problems, and if I have any question, I'll post it on the uh, the side. Sure. I have the sure. lecture. Thank you. No problem. Anyone has questions or anything, just let me know. Thank you for tuning in. All right. Thanks, Chris, for helping on the chat.
Yeah, no problem. Good job. Yeah. Yeah, I saw you had some good questions in there. Do you think I went like too fast when I like speak publicly? I go like really fast for some reason. You could stop the recording too. Oh, okay. Forgot about that. Uh -huh. 